did it seem to you at the time that made this so this is a crazy idea? I mean, here you were with no, like 300 bucks in your pocket, and you're traveling the world. And you decide you're going to go off and become the shoe guy. I never thought it was crazy, but I did. I was acutely aware that it was a long shot. That uh, you know, if I could make this work, that's what I wanted to do, and it had a chance, and I was going to pursue that hard. But I knew at that time, I think the stats were 26 out of every 27 new businesses fail, and so this was this was a bit of a long shot. But I was going to play it for all I could. Knight made a deal to distribute shoes made by a Japanese company called Tiger, which later became ASICS. By 1971, Blue Ribbon Sports would sell in the United States close to 100,000 pairs of Tiger-made shoes and had nearly $2 million in sales. The growth was good, and that was part of the problem. We got attention from other distributors in the U.S. who started uh, trying to romance Tiger, said those guys can sell them any, we can sell a lot more, and that was le what led to the break. We had a, uh, a three-year contract with him. And, uh, recently signed. Yes, recently signed. And, and yet he was sitting there on his visit to the United States, and he had this notebook in his briefcase that he kept referring to, and he said, well, this, this group in Utah thinks they can sell twice as many shoes as what you're selling in Utah. And, uh, and he says, this group in Texas, like, and I'm going, what the hell? And uh, so, yes, he, uh, he got up at one point to go to the bathroom, and I went into his briefcase and pulled the file out and stuck it under the blotter on my desk. And then he came back, we finished our discussions, and said, what's well, beat for dinner? And Wendell and I opened the file, and we were horrified, but we Xeroxed it. And then uh, the next morning, he came back, and I said, block it. We'll have say, okay, Mr. Katami, you can get your... Uh, the tea in the in the coffee room there. It's uh, waiting for you. And Waddell with, was in a wheelchair. He blocked the uh, the exit from the coffee room until I gave him a heads up that the file was back in the briefcase. All right. <laughs> so who is Waddell? I mean, so, I, are you writing well, about Bob Waddell, who is he? I wrote a book, from my viewpoint, from about a band of brothers that got together the, to make this thing work. And Jeff Johnson, who I alluded to earlier, was was the first. But Bob Waddell was uh, probably the second or third. And he had been an outstanding long jumper on the Oregon track team who had had a, a tragic accident uh, building a canoe, so he was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And Barman called and says, Waddell's talking about being a track coach. He says, I don't think that'll really work. He says, uh, why don't you uh, see how it works at your company? And so it started there, and he, uh, he did a phenomenal job for us for uh, 20 years. At many points, you're really strapped for cash. Mm -hmm. you, you need money or you're going under. Banks are shutting you down left, right, and center. Um, tell me about the, the money situation with the Waddell family. Yeah, we were. We were strapped for cash. I was fighting with the banks. I, I would go to the bank almost every day just to let them know where we were. And so their, their collateral was good. It was shoes were selling. Profits were coming. But, uh, but we, we had no They didn't cash always believe you. There. Well, they were, yes, they were somewhat skeptical. But there some of the officers were. But... Uh, Waddell and uh, and then I hired one of my students called Penny Parks. That uh, that uh, one day I saw that both of them were not cashing their their payroll checks. They were keeping them in a drawer. So they were so sympathetic to the whole effort and so into the whole effort. And of course, uh, Waddell was a was a great officer at Nike, and Penny Parks became Mrs. Knight. But uh, that the uh, at one point Waddell said, you know, my mom and dad are working people. They don't have much money, but they said. Uh, They've got about $3,000 in savings. They'd be happy to, to loan it to you. And I said, boy, Bob, I hope I never have to use it. But that's really wonderful. And there came a time about six or eight months later, and I says, we're really hurting. I says, if that offer's still there, I, I'm going to have to take it. And uh, so he said, okay. And, and Mrs. Waddell gave me the check. And I says, thank you so much for doing this, but why? And she says, if you can't trust the employer of your son, who are you going to trust? And uh, so uh, we took the money and we put out a, signed a note that I had 6% interest and they left the money in there for something like seven years. And uh, when we went public, I says, uh, we should convert that to stock, which we did. And uh, that was uh, worth over a million dollars when we went public. And uh, it, was, it was delightful hearing Bob tell the story about telling his parents, uh, he says, mom and dad, you're millionaires. And she said, I don't understand how this works. And he explained it to him, and then she called her daughter and says, "We're millionaires. My son Bob told me so." Were your parents sort of saying, like, uh, you know, Phil, let's let's do this accounting business? I My mean, this this crazy dream, uh, like you're traveling the world for shoes. You don't know anything about shoes. Right. Well, that was that was certainly my father's opinion. <laughs> That's your father's opinion. Yes. <laughs> um, by the way, did he ever say, uh, "Phil, you were right"? There's a story in the book which is uh, kind of explains both my father and the moment that. Uh, he never really said you are right, 
but he used to call every night to find out how his grandkids were doing. And there was that terrible moment when uh, Rudy Tomjanovich got hit by Kermit Washington in an NBA game. And uh, it was awful. It really dislodged part of his head uh, skull from his, uh, his brain. And, uh, and I got home late, but he had been watching the game, and he called me and says, did you see that? And I says, no, I didn't watch it on TV. I just got home. And he says, well, there was the best close-up of the shoes. <laughs> and that, that was the moment when he said, it's okay. The swoosh, the very famous Nike swoosh, mm -hmm. um, how much did you pay for that uh, design? Well, we, when we switched from Tiger to Nike, we were uh, in a hurry. We had, to, we had to get a brand name and we had to get a, a logo for the, for the shoe in a hurry. So there was a graphic arts student at Portland State that had done some work for us and uh, she charged $2 an hour and we said, how about coming up with a, uh, with a logo for the shoe? And uh, she spent 17 and a half hours on it, so it cost us $35. Uh, but, uh, and as I said, it was easily worth it. It's it turned out to be uh, fairly iconic. Uh, but uh, when we went uh, public uh, in 1980, we gave her 500 shares of stock, which she still owns. In 1971, Knight changed the name of the company to Nike. In 1980, he took the company public, and overnight it was worth more than $100 million. That year also saw Nike reach a major milestone, cornering more than half of the athletic shoe market in the United States. We were probably about $600 million of sales then by about 1984, and uh, we really needed a boost, and we thought this young basketball player from North Carolina might be able to help us that way, and his name was Michael Jordan. And but he wanted Adidas. Well, he, he had worn Adidas uh, you know, in, a, in his high school games, and, and, and he liked it. But uh, we came out and we sold him, uh, and uh, ultimately he believed in us, and uh, we sold pretty well that day. This you can buy. You cannot do this. Can, can, can. So, so that was a huge turning point to get Michael Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, and, and still to this day, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's another part that I'm really brand, uh, proud of, that we really turned a, an endorsement into a brand. And obviously, he was a huge part of that because he was such an exciting player and so likable. And uh, but yeah, that changed the industry really. 